The crimes committed by Wade Wilson exemplify a kind of pure evil. Wilson's heinous actions reveal a man utterly lacking in empathy or remorse, highlighting the hostility that can reside in some individuals. However, his story also showcases the resilience, integrity, and strength of the people and systems that resolutely opposed his actions and worked tirelessly to secure justice for the victims. Imagine. It was a seasonably warm 84 degrees in Fort Myers, Florida, on the evening of October 6, 2019. According to a police report, Melissa Mons and her boyfriend of six months, Wade Wilson, decided to head to the beauty bar in Cape Coral for a night of drinks, music, and fun. They pulled up in Melissa's sleek gray 2015 Dodge Hellcat. Inside the bar, a heated argument erupted between them about Wade's desire to leave and visit someone's house. This was a plan Melissa was firmly against. Frustrated, Wade claimed he needed to grab something from the car and went outside. Moments later, Melissa followed, only to witness her Hellcat leaving the parking lot. Strangely, Melissa didn't observe Wade in the driver's seat. The harsh reality dawned on her he had abandoned her and left her stranded without a ride. And not wanting to go home, Melissa reached out to her friend Amy. She promptly picked her up and took her back to her place. Exhausted, Melissa soon passed out. Around 8 a.m. the next morning, she realized that Wade had been trying to contact her multiple times from an unfamiliar number. When she finally picked up the phone, Wade's voice came through loud and furious, demanding to see her immediately. Uneasy due to his history of violence and drug use, Melissa agreed to meet in public at her workplace. She asked Amy to come with her for support and safety, and Amy agreed. As soon as Wade pulled up to her location, she knew something was off as she did not recognize the car he was driving. So, where did you agree to meet him? Milespa. Now, when you arrived at Mila's spa, did you see your Hellcat? No. Uh, did you see a different car? Yes. And was it a car that you recognized? No. I'm showing you State's Exhibit 5. Does this look like the car that he was driving? Yes. And again, was that a car you had ever seen before? No. Now... When you got there, did you get out and try to talk to him? Yes. And again, what were you trying to talk to him about? Um, I went to the driver's side window. He wrote it down. I said, where are my keys? Where's my car? Um, he was calm and just saying, get in the car, get in the car. And it escalated quickly. Did you agree to get in the car? No. And when you would not agree to get in the car, how did he act? Violent aggressive, tried to pull me in the car physically, and I resisted, got plank style so that he could not grab me into the vehicle. When you say you got plank style, could you just show the jurors what you meant, what you mean by that? And I was being pulled into the car by my dress. Okay, so for the record, you just stood up and put your hands straight above your head. Yes, so that I was not being able to be budged into the vehicle. Um, and you said he's pulling at your dress. Yes. Can you describe in more detail how he's pulling at your dress? He's pulling dress, probably a little hair, everything, and then the dress starts to rip off of my body. Um, and what happens after that? Once he realizes that the threads were becoming, uh, I was getting away from him and he was still holding onto the dress, he opens the car door, obviously forgets to put it in park, the car starts to roll forward. He tackles to me to the ground. The car grazes both of our legs, and I'm pummeled to the ground. Um, how hard did he push you to the ground? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't recall. It was this is also fast, and he's very heavy. And I'm I'm five two. He's six six. So now, um, what happens after you are pushed to the ground? I start to get beat. Describe what you mean when you say he was beating you. It all went so fast and so slow, whether it be punches, slapping, choking, 
that kind of nature. Um, yes. Now, you, you mentioned that the fight is happening around the car. Does yeah. the fight move at some point? Yes. So I either get drugged, pulled, can't remember by my hair or arm or dress, to I'm trying to reason with him, trying to talk to him, but there's nobody behind those eyes anymore. So there was no reasoning with him. I got to the, the front of the staircase, and I'm holding on to that. And a crowd begins to develop. I'm expecting people to help, call 911. So I'm just trying to bide my time at that point as quickly as help can get there. And it, that's not working either. I'm starting to get punched and grabbed and choked and all kinds of things again. Somehow we move up to the upper level. I'm trying to convince them, let's just, okay, let's just go and meet us. Let's just. We'll talk about it there. We're safe there. Melissa eventually managed to break free, and she ran to a nearby business seeking safety. Moments later, at 8.48 a.m., Fort Myers police arrived at the scene of the altercation. Multiple 911 calls had reported a man assaulting a woman. Officer Tim McCormick met Melissa at the Milo Spa in downtown Fort Myers, where she identified Wade Wilson as the assailant. She recounted the harrowing assault and mentioned that Wade was last seen driving a black Nissan Versa. By then, Wade had already fled the scene, prompting the police to issue an alert for his capture. At the station, Melissa provided detailed information. During an interview with a detective, she explained that she and Wade had been together for six months after meeting through a mutual friend. They lived together for the first two months until Wade was incarcerated for about three and a half months. Despite his imprisonment, Melissa maintained contact with him and decided to give him a second chance upon his release. While she had heard from others about Wade's abusive behavior, her primary concern was based on her own experiences with him. Wade's criminal records, however, revealed him as a habitual offender with over 20 arrests since 2010 for charges including fraud, trespassing, and physical abuse. In subsequent court, testimony Wade's biological father provided additional insight into his son's upbringing. Good, good morning. Please state your name for the record. Stephen Testaseca. Mr. Testaseca, where are you employed? I'm self-employed. What type of work do you do? Window and door replacement. Are you married? Yes, ma'am. What is your wife's name? How old are you, sir? 46. You know someone by the name of Wade Wilson? Yes, ma'am. How do you know Wade Wilson? He's my son. How old were you when you found out you were going to be his father? 14 or 15. How old was his mother at the time? A year younger than me. Now, were either of you in a position at that age to be able to raise him? No, ma'am. Was he placed up uh, for adoption? Yes, ma'am. Uh, who was he adopted by? Candy and Steve um, Wilson. And did they have any connection to you or Wade Wilson's mother? They went to church with uh, Wade's mother's parents. So uh, that was how they connected and, and ended up raising Wade Wilson? Yes, ma'am. Now, do they have any other children? Yes, ma'am. Two daughters. Now, uh, at some point, did um, you and Wade Wilson connect? Yes, ma'am. Uh, how old was Wade Wilson when he connected with you? 18. And was he uh, wanting to connect with you because you were his biological father? Yes. And up until that point, had you ever met him? No, ma'am. Did you end up um, attempting to have a relationship with him? Yes, ma'am. Did he seem to want to have a relationship? Yes, ma'am. Now, uh, did you have phone calls often? Yes, ma'am. And did you have occasions where you would see each other? No. I went up and visited him one time in Tallahassee. Okay. Now, did he often um, ask you for money? Yes, ma'am. Did your relationship turn into a situation where he was just asking for your help? Yes, ma'am. As Melissa's interview with the detective continued, she expressed that she was terrified of Wade, believing that if he had succeeded in forcing her into the vehicle, she would not be alive to tell her story. 
Melissa mentioned to the detective that Wade had been calling her in the morning hours from numbers she did not recognize, including one with a 603 area code. Police ran that phone number against a database, and they learned the number belonged to a Christine and Melton of Cape Coral. Melissa had never heard of this lady. Soon thereafter, officers arrived at Christine Melton's home on the 4000 block of Tudor Drive, only to discover that officers from a neighboring jurisdiction were already on the scene. Ten, we have an update on a story that we've been following all day. Cape Coral Police confirmed that they are investigating the death of a woman who lived on Tudor Drive. That woman has been identified as 35-year-old Christine Melton. Viewers tell us she is a waitress. And those we spoke to said they didn't see Melton very often and were wondering what happened. Well, you think something bad has happened because you don't get uh, yellow crime scene tape put up for no reason. 35-year-old Christine Melton was described by those close to her as a protector. She loved fiercely and was a precious soul and an irreplaceable force. A once in a lifetime person, Cape Coral police officers classified her death as suspicious and launched a homicide investigation. Notably, her vehicle was missing from the driveway, a black Nissan Versa. This discovery intensified the authorities' efforts to locate both Wade and Christine's vehicle, prompting an urgent and expanded search. Shortly thereafter, about five miles away, Fort Myers police officer Tim McCormick received information regarding Melissa's battery and spotted a vehicle and driver matching Wade's description in the parking lot of a Joe's Crab Shack restaurant. To ensure a coordinated response and his own safety, Officer McCormick quickly called for backup. How you doing? What's going on, man? You're waiting on your girlfriend? Oh, okay. That's no problem. No, I got a call. Somebody was sitting in their car and everything like that. So. Let me see the keys to the car. 
someone in a couple more minutes. Don't go anywhere. Hey. to escape and drove over six miles from Fort Myers to a business on Hancock Bridge Parkway in Cape Coral. Desperate for help, Wade approached Josh, a businessman he knew through a previous employer. He pleaded for money to buy a bus ticket out of town. When Josh declined Wade in a state of agitation, Wade then said, No, you don't understand, Josh. I killed people last night. Alarmed, Josh stepped outside and immediately called 911. Uh, um, I have a, uh, a very unstable uh, man that I just wanted uh, at my office. Hancock Bridge Parkway. Um, it's, uh, he, he's got tattoos, he's short lived, he's very killed some people, and uh, he just hurt a girl in Hancock Bridge Parkway. quickly arrived at the scene, but were unable to immediately locate Wade. During their search, the Cape Coral Police Department learned that Wade was also wanted by the Fort Myers Police Department for the battery against Melissa. Cape Coral officers established a perimeter and extensively searched, but Wade remained elusive. As Cape Coral Police contended with his escape, they were alerted to another urgent situation nearby. Authorities announced they were looking into the disappearance of a 43-year-old mother of two, Diane Ruiz. She was beloved by the community. Diane was reported missing around 4 p.m. after failing to show up for her morning shift at the local Moose Lodge. Her purse was later found abandoned along a roadway. The investigation into Diane's disappearance suggested possible foul play, prompting authorities to classify her as missing and endangered. A black 2019 Nissan Versa was reportedly observed between 10.15 a.m. and 11.15 a.m. traveling eastbound near the area where Diane was last seen. Later that evening, authorities received the break they had been hoping for. A detective had previously contacted Wade's biological father and asked him to alert the police if Wade called. During court testimony, Wade's father frankly recounted what transpired. Now... Did he end up calling you later that evening? Yes, ma'am. And uh, what did he tell you in that call that evening? The final call? Nope, the call, in, the call before the final call. He just told me, you know, he did something. There was two people gone that would not be back. He, he said, I'm a killer. Um, you know, I just told him to call me back. I just thought it was another story. You know. So, so at this point, when he says that um, there were two people that wouldn't be with us and that uh, he was a killer, did you put a lot of weight into that? No, ma'am. Did you think he was just telling you a story? He's a good storyteller. So did he then uh, call you back a third time? Yes, ma'am. What time did he call you back? It was around 10 o'clock. I want to go back to that, that dinner time call. When he talked about these two people who were no longer with us and that he was a killer, did he show any type of remorse? No, ma'am. 
So let's go now to the 10 o'clock call. Um, again, your wife knew about kind of what was going on during that day. Yes, ma'am. And when he called back at 10, uh, did he go into more details about what he had told you earlier? Yes, ma'am. So let's start with the first girl. If you could tell the jurors, what did he tell you? He just said he met a girl at a bar. They went back to her house, hung out for a little bit, and then she fell asleep. What did he say happened after she fell asleep? He said he got on top of her and choked her. What name did he call her? Did he, did he refer to her in a derogatory oh, term? He said, I, I choked that bitch. Um, and what did he say he did after he choked her? He said he stayed in the house for a little while and then um, he rolled her up and was going to try to put her in her trunk, but he couldn't lift her. Did he say why he was unable to put her in her trunk? He said that he felt like rigor mortis had started to set in. And does rigor mortis make your body stiff? You didn't know? I think so. Yeah. Um, so he just told you that that was the reason that he couldn't lift her and get her into her trunk? Yes, ma'am. And when he said her trunk, he, it was the trunk of her car he was going to put her in? Yes, ma'am. So what did he tell you he did when he couldn't get her body into her own trunk? He left her there and took her car. What did he say uh, about the second girl? He said he saw her walking down the street and stopped and asked her for directions. And she got in the car with him. What did he say happened once she got in the car with him? He said he reached over and choked her. And did he tell you that he choked her while he was driving? Yes, ma'am. Now, what did he say happened after he choked her? He said he was looking for a place to put her body. Um, did he find a place where he eventually dumped her body? Yes, ma'am. What did he tell you about uh, the situation when he got to the place where he was going to dump her body? He said that he pulled her out of the car and realized that she was still breathing. So what did he tell you he did when he realized she's still breathing? He said he got back in the car and ran her over until she looked like spaghetti. Now, the whole time that he's telling you these details, is your wife hearing any of these details? I had the phone on speakerphone. Now, prior to him telling you these details, how did you feel about turning him in to law enforcement? I initially wanted to help him. Okay. Um, did you feel conflicted about giving him over to law enforcement initially? Yes, ma'am. Uh, at some point when you're talking with him, did that feeling change? Yes, ma'am. Why? I just thought, you know, what if that was my mom or my daughter or sister or wife? I wouldn't want somebody to do that. And did you have additional concerns of what might happen if you didn't turn him into law enforcement? Yes, ma'am. What was that, sir? He would have done it again. Now, after he's telling you all these details, do you know where he's at when he's telling you these things? I just knew he was in a house that uh, he broke into when he was running from the uh, police. Did you know uh, the actual address of this house he broke into? No, ma'am. Now, when you were talking to him and you decided that you needed to give the information to law enforcement about his whereabouts, how did you get that address from him? I told him I was going to send him an Uber and I needed the address. Wade's father relayed his son's whereabouts to a detective who then passed that information to the U.S. Marshal Service and the Regional Fugitive Task Force. Wade had broken into and was hiding in a home occupied by a married couple who fortunately had left town for Ohio just that morning. The agencies contacted Wade and after about 30 minutes of giving loud verbal commands for him to exit the residence, 
He opened the front door where agents took him into custody without incident. Wade was transported to the Cape Coral Police Department for booking and later to the Lee County Jail. According to a report published online, dated October 15, 2019, and authored by Caitlin Greenockle, Wade's ex-girlfriend Melissa claimed that Wade called her from jail the previous day and confessed to killing Christine Melton and Diane Ruiz, whose body was found in a field behind the Sam's Club. On October 10th, he admitted over the phone to me that he killed both of these women. He strangled both of them. He said he just felt like it. He said he was on drugs, and it messed him up, explained Melissa. About six weeks after the deaths of Christine and Diane, the state attorney's office organized a press conference to make an important announcement regarding the case against Wade Wilson. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I am State Attorney Amira Fox, and I stand here today with Cape Coral Police Chief Dave Newland and our teams from both our offices to announce the indictment of Wade Stephen Wilson for the murders of Christine Melton, age 35, and Diane Ruiz, 43, both of Cape Coral. The Lee County Grand Jury met today and returned an indictment against Wilson for two counts of first degree premeditated murder. He was also indicted for one count each of battery, grand theft of a motor vehicle, burglary of a dwelling, and first degree petty theft. Christine Melton was found dead in her Cape Coral home on October 7th. The body of Diane Ruiz was found on October 12th in a field in Cape Coral, four days after she was reported missing. I hope today's indictment brings some small comfort to the families of these victims. These two women were preyed upon by the defendant and their murders impacted their families and shook our community. The Cape Coral Police Department investigated these homicides and the events leading up to them, which led to the arrest of the defendant. And I wanna say a huge thank you to Chief Newland, his command staff, and the two detectives who worked this case, among others who stand up here with us today, Detective Bell and Detective Jones, and thank them for the absolutely excellent investigative work. They were meticulous, they were patient, and that is why we stand here today with a successful indictment for two counts of first-degree murder. The following day, Wade made his initial court appearance on the charges via remote video. Wade Wilson, 19 <laughs> CF 568. Mr. Wilson, uh, you're charged with first-degree murder, grand theft auto, battery, uh, a second uh, first-degree murder, burglary of a dwelling. Occupied and petty theft. The state want to be heard? Briefly, Judge. I'm Grant Gardner on behalf of the state. The state respected your request, and Mr. Wilson be held no bond. Uh, defense? The Honor Charge and Answer Public Defense Office. I believe Judge Branning took uh, testimony and signed the previous no bond. Any other uh, bond motions will be conducted with the trial judge? Very good. Mr. Wilson will be held without bond. Your court date is. November 25th, 2019, at 8.30 a.m. in courtroom 4A. If somehow you get out of jail, you will have no contact with your directly. Is that someone? All right. You will have no contact directly or indirectly with Melissa Lynn Montez. It's away from 29 West Street in Fort Myers, Florida. Do you understand that, sir? Sure. That's all for today. Since his arrest in the early hours of October 8, 2019, Wade was held in custody without bail. His trial faced numerous delays over the years due to frequent continuances and pretrial motions. During this period, Wade underwent a personal transformation, notably adding numerous facial tattoos, including swastika tattoos. In response, the defense requested the court allow facial makeup to cover these tattoos, arguing they could prejudice the jury. Although the court granted this request, the defense ultimately chose not to use the makeup. Following an alleged escape attempt by Wade, the trial was finally ready to proceed on June 10, 2024. A jury was seated, 
An opening arguments were heard in the capital case of Florida versus Wade Wilson. Throughout the trial, multiple witnesses came forward to report that Wade confessed to the murders of Melton and Ruiz. In fact, the defense did not dispute many of the facts in the case, but argued for diminished responsibility, at one point claiming he's just whacked out of his mind. After roughly two hours of deliberations, the jury reached a verdict. All right, do you have the verdict form? All right, let me pass that to the bill. appears to be in order. I'll have the clerk publish the verdict. In the circuit court of the 20th Judicial Circuit and in Fort Lee County, Florida, criminal action, State of Florida versus Wade Wilson, case number 19CF0568, verdict. We the jury finds as follow as to the defendant in this case. Count one, first degree murder, Christine Melton. The defendant is guilty of first degree murder. Count two, grand theft motor vehicle. The defendant is guilty of grand theft motor vehicle. Count three, battery. The defendant is guilty of battery. Count four, first degree murder, Diane Ru Ruiz. The defendant is guilty of first-degree murder. A jury found Wade Wilson guilty on all counts, including the first-degree murders of Christine Melton and Diane Ruiz. The penalty phase of the capital case against Wade will begin on June 20, 2024. During the penalty phase of the trial, the jury voted 9-3 to and 10-2 to in favor of the death penalty for the murder convictions. Judge Nicholas Thompson will decide whether to impose the death sentence or life in prison without the possibility of parole. The jury recommended the death sentence for each of the homicides, and sentencing is scheduled for late July 2024. Wilson's attorney has filed a motion seeking a new trial. While awaiting trial, Wilson was charged with masterminding an escape attempt from the Lee County Jail. On July 12, 2024, Wade Wilson, the Fort Myers man facing the death penalty in the murders of two Cape Coral women has reputed ties to a violent Florida prison gang. Wilson was found guilty in June of the 2019 murders of Christine Melton, 35, and Diane Ruiz, 43. Sentencing is scheduled for July 23, 2024. In this story of one man's evil actions, we take a moment to acknowledge the extraordinary resilience and courage of those who dared to stand against him. The brave individuals who played a vital role in ending Wade Wilson's reign of terror deserve recognition for their selfless action and unwavering determination. For example, Stephen Testaseca, who became a father in his early teen years and made the difficult choice to have him put up for adoption faced an unimaginable emotional conflict when he decided to turn his son into the police. The bond between a father and son is deeply rooted in love, loyalty, and protection. Similarly, Melissa showed remarkable bravery in the face of fear, her willingness to provide critical information and testify against Wade was instrumental in his arrest and conviction. Her actions helped to bring justice to the families of Christine Melton and Diane Ruiz, offering them some measure of peace and closure. These acts of courage and integrity highlight the strength of individuals and the systems in place to uphold justice. It reminds us that it takes a village to ensure that justice prevails and that the light of humanity shines through. Thanks for listening to this episode. Please leave your thoughts below. We will be back next time, of course, to bring you yet another case. But until then, stay safe out there and please subscribe.